Okay, so thanks, Eric. Um, so I'm my talk's now sort of as I mentioned at the beginning, the nuts and bolts talk. Um, so uh, what we wanted to do in this project is look at. Oh, you know what? I should probably put those slides up. Um, thank you for that. Uh, okay, so and I have to stay in front of the mic. Um, so that right there, what you're looking at a picture of, just to get you situated, is the city of Snohomish. This is during the um, floods of January 2009. We're looking east there into the river. Um, you can see quite a bit of area flooded. And actually, just off the right hand side of the frame, you can't see it, um, is, uh, oh, well, so first of all, the highway going across. That's, that's S State Route 9, if you're familiar with the area. And just off to the right of the frame is actually an airport, which frequently gets flooded in, in the valley. So. Uh, there's there's sort of a quite quite a variety of impacts in the Snohomish River Basin, um, and the point of this project was to look at what gets flooded when and how much more will the, will flooding occur in the future with climate change. Um, so this is this project is um, related to the um, larger effort um, by the Nature Conservancy and the Department of Ecology um, called Floodplains by Design. Um, which is uh, which Julie will talk a lot more about, um, uh, but it's centered around these sort of multi-objective um, uh, <coughs> floodplain management approach, where you're really not just looking at sort of traditional floodplain management, uh, protecting people and property, but also thinking about habitat restoration and other benefits, mm -hmm. protection, protecting agriculture and that sort of thing. So it's trying to bring everyone to the table. Julie and, and Debbie can go into a lot more detail on that. Um, but just to introduce it. And so we're focusing on the, let me see if I can figure this out, on the Snohomish River Basin, which is right in here. Um, and, uh, and, I'll, so, and I'll show a, a more detailed map of that. But before I get into that, I want to just sort of recap what Eric said. So, so you know, we, Eric's, the main gist of what Eric said is that we think the Northwest is going to be particularly sensitive to changes in flood risk. Why, um, I think Eric did a good, job of summarizing this, so I don't need to spend a lot of time, but sea level rise, we've got a lot of low elevation coastal floodplains, storms, he showed some evidence for increasing extreme storm magnitudes, and snow, the big, especially in the near term one, um, which mainly affects winter flood risk by just increasing the area of the watershed that's contributing to stream flow in those events. Okay, so, uh, so we've got all that data. I, I, Eric showed you examples of it. We've got all that data, so uh, why isn't my talk ending right here? Right, so what's missing? Um, so there's two things missing, really, right? Uh, so the first thing is that's missing is that uh, it's what we have information on is what's the water level in the, in the, in the Puget Sound and how much water is in the river. But we, what we don't have is where that water is going, what areas are flooded and what are not. And for that, you really need a hydraulic or a hydro hydrodynamic model to look at inundation. And that's really the thrust of what we're doing here is what, is, what areas are inundated and how deep is the water over them, right? Second thing is, uh, you, you need to do that, uh, to do that you need to combine, well we need to look at the combined effects of sea level rise and river flooding, right? So we think there will be compounding effects in a lot of places. Um, so is that happening here? Is, uh, what is the effect of bringing both of those together? And I should mention that we're not the first ones to do this. So this work builds heavily or leans heavily on what Joe Hammond and Alan Hamlet did in the Skagit River Basin. This is just showing an example of their work. Um, they used the FEMA model to look at uh, flooding in the Skagit River Basin. This is uh, one example uh, for the historical flood, assuming um, uh, levee failures, I believe, a, a number of levee failure scenarios, and then looking far into the end of the century um, uh, and changes in the area inundated as a result. So, uh, but we're in the Snohomish. Here's, the, um, here's the, what Wikipedia gives you when you look up the Snohomish. Um, and uh, we're actually focusing on the main stem of the lower Snohomish right here. Uh, so uh, everything down from the confluence of the Skykomish and the Snoqualmie rivers. All right, so, how, so, so that's all the sort of introduction. So how are we doing this? We're, um, you know, I mentioned you need to do hydraulic or hydrodynamic modeling to really look at inundation. So we've, we've been working with West consultants um, who had a partially developed hydraulic model. They finished it and calibrated it on uh, two separate flood events um, the last couple of decades. And this is the really unreadable uh, model schematic um, showing uh, the entire model domain from this is right about where Monroe is all the way up to the, the estuary up here. Okay, and, and so I'm going to give you the nuts and bolts, but I wanted to first sort of preview what the results look like. This, uh, Julie is going to go into more detail on this, but this is the 
a screenshot of the decision support tool that the, the Nature Conservancy has put together. Um, and uh, and what, it's showing, what I'm showing right here is the historical 10-year flood uh, out, of, out of the hydraulic model. Um, so you're seeing area inundated and, and depth um, in this, uh, the valley bottom in the lower Snohomish here. Okay, so how do we get there? I just want to sort of walk through that. Uh, so for, um, so coastal flooding. So what are, we ex what are the mechanisms or what are the things we need to quantify to be able to look at this, right? So there's this really sort of an, a number of factors we have to include, right? So we want to look at storm surge. Eric mentioned this. Tides, that's sort of an obvious one. Waves, uh, stream flow, freshwater runoff, um, and sea level rise. Um, I put sea level rise at the end rather than with all these other ones that relate to the sound just because it's, Rather than these, which are really sort of transient, um, uh, short-term uh, effects, this is, this is really sort of a long-term secular rise sort of in a, in a camp on its own. Okay, so I just want to walk through each of these briefly and talk about where we got our data. So storm surge. Um, I looked at the uh, Seattle, storm, uh, Seattle tide gauge and just looked at surge as the difference between tidal observations and predictions. Um, and these are the numbers I got for the 10-year uh, event of storm surge, so quite, quite a bit of uh, rise. It's, I was pretty struck by how, how much higher sea level can be than what you just ex predict based on the tides. And the 100-year event even higher still. And, and, and I should note, this is, this is for Seattle because they have the longest record, but it turns out it's highly correlated. I looked at the Everett gauge, which is closer to the mouth of the Snohomish, and, and, and they agree quite well. And just as a technical aside, I'd be happy to talk to somebody in detail if they're interested, but I actually use Fiskew surge, which is a less biased measure. And now that you're all asleep, I'll go on to the next slide. Um, oh, one, one other detail, um, storm surge, so as Eric intimated, you know, um, this is partly based on Joe Hammond's work and, and what we've been doing looking at winds. We currently don't see any evidence that storm surge is going to increase in the future. So what we've done in our simulations is assume that historical storm surge holds through the rest of the century. All right, tides, uh, our tides, that's, that's easy, right? We put in the predictive tides, easy to do. There's no, obviously no change of climate change. Uh, uh, waves, again, uh, we, we don't include, um, uh, for primarily because Whidbey Island is directly the west of the, of the mouth of the Snohomish. There's really no fetch, so uh, tides are not really an issue here. So we're left these, with these last two, the sort of big ones. So stream flow. Okay, stream flow, again, just as a reminder, this is our domain, and, and really what we want is we want to know how big is the flood peak coming in here, and how big is the flood peak coming in from this smaller tributary here in the, the Pilchuck? Um, well, it turns out we're lucky we have that data already, so it's just a matter of going in and digging it up, doing a little bit of extra work to have it ready. This is an example showing st um, stream flow for the Snohomish River at Monroe for the end of the century for the 20, 50, and 100 year um, peak flows, daily peak flows. Um, and just to spell that out, um, what that translates to, if you look at just um, at uh, return intervals, is what was the 100-year flood at the end of last century is more like a 30-year flood at the end of this century. That's what the middle of the road projection says. Okay, uh, I don't want to get too technical, but what we so I'm just going to not going to spend a lot of time on this, but we I want to just sort of give you the full nuts and bolts story, so I'm including it. Um, and th what we used is um, the FEMA synthetic hydrograph rather than an actual hydrograph. And I, I bring this up, I think it's just important to know about because it sort of highlights what's different when you start to look at flooding here. And I think maybe th this will get in, this will have some relevance when we're talking to, when Julie and Debbie are talking, is that what FEMA and others try to do when they're designing towards a, a flood event is they don't want to get the most real 100-year flood event. They want to get the best estimate of the sort of worst case scenario, right? So that's why they construct this synthetic event, which actually incorporates not only the, the in this case, the 100-year instantaneous peak flow, but the one day, three day, five day, and seven day. So it's sort of, if all of this happened at once. And we, we can go ahead and calculate that from our numbers and we can do it for the pill check too. Uh, all right, the last one is sea level rise. Um, Eric promised I'd talk about this. So, so I took this data just from the, the National Research Council report, which is sort of in the middle of what's out there and between the IPCC and some of the higher end estimates. Um, and I also incorporated, you know, a big factor here is we're, we're talking not just about sea level rise, but about relative sea level rise. So what is the land doing relative to the sea? And, and we do have a very tectonically active region here. Um, and I used the 
fairly conservative estimate from, uh, from that same report of uh, one millimeter per year of subsidence. So actually the, the land movement is going down, so it's accelerating the rate of sea level rise in the Snohomish. And just looking at the GPS gauges, it looks like some of the others are measuring higher rates. So this is, I think, a fairly conservative estimate of what's going on. Um, this is actually that, uh, the, the, the data it's, that itself is published in that report, just for reference. Um, okay, so finally, I'm, I'm going to show you a, little, a few results. So this is the one I already showed you sort of as a preview. This is the historical 10-year flood. And there's, there's sort of two main take-homes from this. So I'll show you and I'll summarize what, what I think are the sort of interesting take-homes and then we can move on to Julie's talk. So, so again, this is the historical 10-year event. So what happens if we look at the 2080s? And what we did in this project is we, we did two runs for the 2080s. We did a low-end scenario based on a low-end, based on both the uh, low-end model projection and the low-end greenhouse gas scenario. And that's what this shows. So this is the lowest 2080 scenario. So you can toggle back and forth and you can see the difference. Um, there's some increase in area, especially um, in a couple of air places down in the estuary and up here. Um, and then we, we compared that to the high end, so the highest model along with the highest emissions scenario. Um, so that's, this is the low and this is the high. And that's really where you see the big differences. Essentially, it's valley wall to valley wall in terms of flooding for the 10-year flood in the most pessimistic scenario at the end of the century. Right? Um, so those are the two end of century scenarios. So that's the one take home is um, the levees, okay, so a detail here is the levees in the Somish River are, are at least intended to be 10 year levees. So that's why we're seeing these big changes. The other interesting detail is if you look at the 100 year uh, flood, this is historically, they're 10 year levees, right? So the flooding happens essentially everywhere. So instead with the 100 year flood, you're just seeing changes in the depth. The area is not really changing. This is the low and the high. Um, and what's interesting is actually if you just look at the 100 year historical and you compare that to the 10 year most pessimistic scenario, there's not much different. And that's not because the, that's become a 10 year flood at the end of the century, it's because they're 10 year levees, right? So this is where, again, where the, the details um, on the ground really matter is, is what is, it's not just about the science but about the infrastructure and, and what is actually there. Um, okay, so I, I'm gonna stop talking there. I'm happy to take some questions and uh, otherwise I'll pass it off to Julie. Thanks. So you're, you're, you're asking about regulation above um, Monroe. So yeah, we were using unregulated flows. We assumed that um, that you know because it's just a small tributary that's regulated up above it that it doesn't have a big effect on floods. It is calibrated, um, but I'm going to have to say, I don't know if Seiyun, I think I saw Seiyun here. I, th I think it's calibrated to naturalized flows, is that right? Yeah, so it's, we're not accounting for regulation. Yeah, David. Um, my understanding is you, is you used the, you had the flood occurring during the high tide and the large storm surge. Also. We did, although we did some, we, so the question, yeah, I guess you have I'm to not, yeah, I'm, um, I have more than the question. That's a lead-in. We I'm, did. I'm just wondering if you estimated the probability of, of these events, given you yep. sort of different forcings all at the right. worst case, and the FEMA, you know, worst case flood. Do you have an estimate of yeah. the prob uh, actual probability of uh, so I think uh, there are many way different things that you could be asking right there, but I'll, uh, I'll take a guess. So um, I, like I think there are two. Of these, all, all these things occurring at the same yep. time. Right. So the question is, right, you've got tides, you've got surge, you've got peak river flows. They don't necessarily happen all the time. What's really what you're asking is what's the joint probability that defines what the 10-year event is. So with tides, we did some sensitivity testing, it, and um, essentially um, we got similar results for peak water levels wherever we put the tide relative to the peak flow. And part of the, uh, and, and then we looked at surge, and, and just from the observational record, and there's essentially no correlation between when surge happens and when peak flows happen. So they're basically completely independent events. So if you're in the estuary, you can be getting flooded, and people in Monroe are not having any problems at all, right? Or Snohomish, for that matter. 
um, and vice versa. So that actually makes our problem easy. So what we actually end up doing, this is really getting in the weeds, but we just modeled what happens with, for, during a surge event and no change in stream flow, and vice versa, what happens when you have peak flow event, and just looked at the worst case scenario for both. And there, it turns out the area where they overlap is really small, so that's not really a factor. So it's, um, it's either one or the other. Yeah. Yeah, um, so are you asking, you know, uh, mm, I'm not sure if you're asking something that sort of relates to what Eric was covering in the sense of uh, as the snow line recedes. So the question was, is there a snowpack effect? It, as the snow line recedes, there's a larger catchment area, and that's the cause for flooding. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. yeah. So uh, you know, I think that's very likely, right? I mean, I think that it's a larger contributing basin area. We, I don't, we haven't done any specific experiments to, to be able to say yes, certainly. But in the sense that change, changes in, ex well, this is a, actually a statistical downscaled. Um, so uh, we're not seeing very big changes in extreme precipitation. So snowpack is really the likely candidate here. I should mention we did look at um, what the WERF model, what the, the regional climate model says, and it was right in the middle of what the statistical downscale. Um, so, so sometimes they say the same thing. All right, thanks.